Hello, I'm Robin Cole, and welcome to the Satellite Image Deep Learning Podcast. In this episode, I caught up with Samuel Bancroft to learn about segmenting field boundaries using Segment Anything, also known as SAM. SAM is a foundational model for vision released by Meta, which is capable of zero-shot segmentation. However, there are many open questions about how to make use of SAM with remote sensing imagery. In this conversation, Samuel describes how he used SAM to perform segmentation of field boundaries with Sentinel-2 imagery over the UK. His best results were obtained not by fine-tuning SAM, but by carefully pre-processing a time series of images into HSV color space and using SAM without any modifications. This is a surprising result, and using this kind of approach significantly reduces the amount of work necessary to develop useful remote sensing applications utilizing SAM. I hope you enjoy this episode. Hi, Sam. Welcome to the podcast. Hi, uh, thanks for inviting me. It's my pleasure. Let's begin with where you work and what you do. Sure. Um, uh, I'm a PhD student at the University of Leeds. Um, I've been doing my PhD uh, since 2020, and it's all been about crop type classification. So uh, like the rest of machine learning, you're always on the hunt for more and more labels. Crop type classification is no different. Um, so I'm trying to uh, develop new machine learning methods that rely less on the labels that are very expensive to acquire and just making things that are more generalizable so I can do big mapping campaigns and work out where the crops are growing across a whole country. Right, so that's the goal. Exhaustively. Yeah, that's the goal. Limited data or annotated data, I know it end. A model that would generalize across the whole country, in this case, the United Kingdom. Okay, well, let's. where do we begin? What, what solution have you come up with? Sure. So um, uh, it's been a long process, but um, uh, I'm talking to you today about UK fields. So that's a data set containing uh, millions of field boundaries across England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. Um, that has been in collaboration with uh, Jake Wilkins, who I believe has been on this podcast previously. So that we started a conversation about using uh, Meta or Facebook's uh, new machine learning model that came out April last year called Segment Anything. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people have tried to use that to apply to Earth observation. Uh, and we've applied that to the UK to create field boundaries. Right. And what are some of the limitations that the SAM has? Sure. So. Um, SAM is built to, or segment anything otherwise known as SAM, SAM, uh, is built to segment a wide range of many different things from people in photographs to cats and dogs and road signs. It's not necessarily uh, adapted to aerial imagery, although sure, perhaps aerial imagery was part of the original training set. Um, it's also built around RGB, red, green, blue images. And we all know that Earth observation images don't necessarily need to just be RGB. So when we take a big foundation we'll like segment anything and we apply it to Earth observation, we don't necessarily get the results we want. Right. So we want to do feature engineering or fine tuning and stuff like that to bring it more into our domain. Interesting. So obviously you want to apply SAM to the, the boundary detection. What's some of the stages that you went through in your experimentation and where did you arrive at? Sure. Uh, so the story actually began uh, at a workshop last year that um, uh, I attended and um, some academics uh, from a, a university in Germany um, set out with this initial task of how can we apply segment anything to field detection? Um, and I think my original attempt was to look at things like NDVI and edge detection and feed that in and stuff like that. Uh, we also tried to fine tune the model, which I can talk a little bit about later as well. Um, and there was some success, particularly lots of success in like uh, easy agricultural landscapes like uh, the US Midwest, where the fields are really, really obvious. Um, but when I applied it to the UK, just for my own personal bias, it didn't do well across the board, not well enough to outcompete the traditional field boundary detection methods that are out there. So, uh, right. so um, North America, the fields are very large and irregular grids and in the UK they're maybe not so regular is that the case definitely yes uh uh very flat very big fields in the US across huge areas in the UK it can change very very quickly right. uh, particularly between the urban and rural areas right okay very interesting and um, what data did you use for this or did you restrict yourself to any one data source sure so uh the UK fields data set as is released um is built upon Sentinel-2 imagery, uh, mainly because it's a framework 
that hopefully anyone will want to use for Sentinel-2 and it gets good high quality field boundaries at the 10 meter scale. Mm -hmm. uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that you just need to use Sentinel-2. Um, we're releasing the code so you can just swap out uh, for any other um, data, uh, data source. So for example, we've been playing around with planet imagery as well. It works um, with some quite interesting results at the five meter scale as well. Very interesting. Do you want to talk us through the, the process of using maybe Sentinel to begin with? And, you know, maybe we could start at the beginning, how you, you make use multispectral data with a three-channel model. Sure, yes. Uh, should I bring up my slides? Yeah, go for it. Definitely, okay. All right, so to begin with, the... Uh, uh, solution to how to make UK fields work consistently across a whole country uh, very much uh, lies on making harmonic composites. Uh, now, this isn't a completely fresh idea. Harmonic composites have exist and existed a long, long time uh, for a variety of different reasons. Uh, I've used um, harmonics to uh, uh, do crop type classification in an unsupervised way, so using no labels whatsoever, mm -hmm. trying to identify Dis, uh, distinct different crop types automatically. Um, and you can do this in Google Earth Engine relatively easily. Um, and other people, no doubt, have been using this with their own field delineation algorithms. Just to um, clarify but, for the readers, uh, the listeners, sorry, the, the harmonics are fitted to a time series, essentially. Yes. So um, what you're looking at here is a little bit of a kaleidoscopic image but it's representing um, a time series of images. And how that's done uh, is it's taking a vegetation index, in this case, NDVI, across a 12-month growing period, um, and it's taking and it's fitting a harmonic model to that time series. And from that harmonic model, from each pixel, you can get the phase, the amplitude, and the, the mean NDVI um, of that particular pixel. Uh, and we map that to the HSV hue saturation value color space so uh, the phase because it's cyclical um, can be the hue um, saturation can be the amplitude and value can be the uh, the mean ndvi and once you put that and encode that as this kind of static image here you get loads of different colors right um, and the hope is that something like this is much more uh, easily interpretable by segment anything um, than uh, median RGB composites, just in yeah. a normal way. At a high level, we can see there's the boundaries are quite quite clear there. I suppose for in any one time, just an RGB, the boundaries wouldn't be quite so clear. Uh, yes, yeah, no, definitely. Right. Um, there's a few good examples about uh, just using an RGB composite and comparing it to this and seeing the accuracy jump up a little bit. So what we did actually is we tested um, segment anything just with normal color imagery compared to the harmonic approach and it bumps up the uh what's known as the uh, uh dice score which is a nice accuracy metric that uh, just bumps it up by like 0.2 on um, uh, an average so a significant improvement basically um mm -hmm. so it really does uh, fix a lot of the problems with a few of the odd fields that don't get segmented properly okay so the basic process is take your time series over 12 months generate one of these hsv images and then uh pass it through segment anything without any kind of fine tuning or modification for this situation yeah fantastic yeah. no it's a it's a good, a good example of uh don't reinvent the wheel as perhaps i tried to do when i initially set out to do this mm -hmm. um and uh just rely a little bit on feature engineering right excellent and how do the results you know metrically speaking look across the uk um sure so if i load, bring up the right slides um these are the results scoring against uh the next best available uh ground truth as validation data so um we've taken our uk field data set uh we've split it up in terms of the grid cells and worked out the average um dice score intersection over union under segmentation and over segmentation rates um, compared to the ordnance survey so that's the national mapping agency government agency for the uh, the uk we have compared that to the fields in the master map data set that they've got available mm -hmm. um so um for those thinking about harmonic composites already you'll notice that uh, the fields that 
are strongly agricultural, that are growing crops, that have very distinct growing curves, will do very, very nicely in a harmonic composite. And you can see that reflected here. You can see the East Coast, uh, big growing regions of the UK get very nice scores, so, you know, 0 0.7, 0 0.8 dice score, which is really, really good. Mm -hmm. um, when you get to uh, uh, non-agricultural areas like Scottish Highlands or where there's not many crops grown, for example, Cumbria, uh, it doesn't do so well. Um, but um, the the hope is UK fields, it's releasing so many agricultural fields. You're not really very interested in fields um, in non-agricultural non areas, right? So when we release the data set, there won't be um, fields over the Scottish Highlands. Um, and I don't think anyone's necessarily too going to be too worried about that, the lack of them. Yeah, uh, makes a lot of sense. Um, fantastic. Do you want to dive into a few more of the details around uh, maybe the pre and the, the pre-processing? Uh, I think you had a couple of extra Definitely, slides. Yes. Uh... Yeah. Um, I, I should say um, releasing this kind of data set is probably born out a lot of frustration in my PhD when I had tried to get my hands on field data very easily. Um, there's a few offerings in the UK that, that you can make use of, but sometimes they're paywalled or the methods aren't very easy to uh, to work out mm -hmm. compared to uh, other countries in mainland Europe, which is much, much easier to get hold of more timely data. Mm -hmm. uh, and I told myself, if I ever made the field boundaries myself for my own research, I'd make it available so people didn't wouldn't have to go through the, the same old slog to, to get mm -hmm. the same data. So the ultimate aim of this is, yes, so other researchers can look at fields over the UK, but by releasing the code as well, we're hoping that other people create more field boundaries over loads of other regions all across the world. So it's right. just a single line import in Google Earth Engine and suddenly you've got your fields to work with um, because this kind of data is just a stepping stone for the next further bits of analysis that you need to do. Mm -hmm. um, so cool. that's an important thing that hopefully... Uh, releasing this will make a big difference um there's also a few like quality uh useful features in the code release that um hope people can make some good use of um we could have released the code and just told you how to segment different tiles because you've got to if you map in the whole uk right you've got to chip it up into lots of different uh, adjacent areas and do your results but when you stitch it all together if it detects one field in one chip and then the next chip over, the next adjacent chip, it doesn't necessarily get the same field. Mm -hmm. Merging it together becomes a complete headache. Mm. So what we've got here is uh, what we first do in Google Earth Engine is we export overlapping chips, probably about 10% either side. Uh, we do that in an overlapping fashion um, such that we can merge them together later. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is just a quick visualization of how we do merge them together. So we do like a, a radial weighting. So we take a kernel, a radial weighting kernel on the left-hand side that you can see there. Mm -hmm. And we apply that to the inference result we get from segment anything on the harmonic composite, which you can mm -hmm. see in the middle tile. Mm -hmm. Merge them together. And you can say that the results in the very center of that tile we're most confident about. And those on the periphery, um, not so much. And then when we stitch together all the overlapping ones, so if we go left to right here, we take the first tile, weight it, apply it to the next weighted tile, and then the next one, and then the next one. And it just builds up the weighted average, right? Such that if you take all of the, the weightings, you add them all together, then you binarize it at the end, it just means that there's no ugly discontinuities between the different tiles and uh, mm -hmm. information isn't lost. Um, yeah. and uh, sometimes this code when you're doing it in scale at scale can be a little bit tricky so we're releasing it so you can do this in google cloud and the google cloud platform and mm -hmm. so you don't even need to bring any data onto your own laptop to do this kind of stuff and also if you do want to use stuff on your own laptop we have that code available as well right okay uh, i'm not too familiar with how that would work on google you just give it the function and when api access yeah, and there's also some very useful GDAL commands, um, but uh, uh, it, it, it it took me a long time to to get it all in the right place and working. Um, the right incantation, so yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh... Awesome. That's, that's an amazing result and some really nice technology built around it to make it very practical for use. Um, 
I'm also interested a bit in the paths that you went down that didn't work out. You mentioned uh, fine tuning of Sam. This is something that sort of people have talked about doing, but nobody's really sure how to do. Do you mind talking a bit about that? Yes, no, definitely. Um, uh, it's very important to talk about all the failures because if I'd uh, gone through all of this and not released it, uh, it's been hidden away. Um, uh, one of the first big things I tried um, was fine tuning the segment anything to work better on RGB images. And I was inspired by, um, I think it was called MedSAM. So it was segment anything fine tuned against medical images. So I took um, some code off GitHub and tried to play around with it and swapped out the medical image data sets for um, a popular field boundary benchmark data set called AI for Boundaries, which contains loads of Sentinel-2 imagery and corresponding field boundaries across a huge part of Europe, I believe. Um, and I fine-tuned that. Um, and at first I thought I was getting better results, but, uh, this is also, it was very much just a, a pet project in the background. I was training for many hours at a time using a lot of GPU time, just playing around with this. Mm -hmm. Um, but the end result was no matter what type of model I use, there's three different versions of segment, anything with different numbers of parameters, uh, no matter what I tried, it didn't it didn't properly uh, bump up the accuracy in any meaningful way. In many cases, right. it made it worse. Uh, right. Now, I'm not saying that uh, it's impossible to fine tune it. I'm just saying that my attempts um, at doing it in a very much a background fashion just didn't work out in the end. It was a lot of work uh, for very little gain. Right. Uh, and this uh, harmonic composite approach was a lot less work for a lot more gain and a lot more yeah. consistent results across the board. Yeah, I think for me, that's a standout sort of takeaway that, you know, you can fine tune models or maybe you can take existing models and experiment with the feature engineering, as you put it, and potentially that's a, a more viable route. Yeah, definitely. Sometimes there comes a point where if you've got something that works, you just, just got to release it. You've got to make sure that other people can build on that as well. well really exciting stuff. Uh, I think on your last slide, you've got the GitHub link. Maybe we just... Uh, put that one up and um, then we can just say, okay, so everything is being published at the moment. Uh, you're finishing your PhD now. Uh, what's what's uh, next for you and what, what are your ambitions after having done this? Uh, so uh, I came into my PhD from industry uh, and very much at the end of my PhD, I'll be looking to return to industry. Um, I'm all about agriculture, earth observation, machine learning. So I'll be looking for um, a, a job in those kind of uh, fields very soon um Excellent. my phd fin uh, finishes at the end of october that's october 24 so only a few months away exciting and if people want to follow along your your updates which is the best platform for that uh best uh way to uh, be best informed when this is all released is to look at my twitter so that's at spirowell okay fantastic once again thank you uh fascinating conversation and all the best for the write-up and hopefully we'll hear from you again in the future Lovely. Thank you very much for your time, Robin. Bye. Cheers.